Welcome back. I hope you are having a great day and uh, welcome to the fourth mini lecture on the Constitution and I'm continuing our investigation of social contract theory. Remember that all so social contract theorists believe that political power comes from the people, that the governors and governed uh, were involved in mutual consent. The idea here is that governments were formed by the rationality of people, that people make the assumption that we're better off with government than without it. Now, Hobbes had a very sinister view of human nature. He prioritized order. He wanted a monarchy. He believed that if government did not exist, that state of nature situation, that life would be a struggle for survival. That solitary, nasty, brutish, and short conversation that I had last time. So, all social contract theorists, including Hobbes, including Locke, including Montesquieu, including Jefferson and Madison and our founding fathers believe that in this particular case, governments are created by this social contract. With John Locke, we are going to get a very different social contract theorist. Uh, certainly, uh, Locke uh, agrees with Thomas Hobbes that government is created by mutual consent. Uh, John Locke believes that we're better off with government than without it. However, John Locke has a very different assumption about human nature. While Hobbes's was more sinister, John Locke's was much more benevolent. Uh, Locke believed that people are basically good. Uh, and the biggest problem with the state of nature is not that it would be warlike, which is what Hobbes believed, but instead it would be unfulfilled. Not a state of war, but unfulfilled. There wouldn't be a rule of law. And good people would struggle preserving their natural rights, particularly property rights. And this is really important uh, for you and I. I'm always talking about how uh, this stuff is about our lives. And John Locke, in particular, heavily impacts Thomas Jefferson, uh, heavily impacts our Declaration uh, of Independence. Uh, I mentioned earlier that for Americans, the primary political value uh, is order, and certainly uh, that is Locke's belief. Locke believes that before the creation of government, uh, individual people in the state of nature would be endowed with certain natural or God-given rights. Uh, for John Locke, these are life, liberty, and property. Uh, and certainly you see these influences in the Declaration uh, of Independence. Uh, in the Declaration of Independence, uh, John Locke's life, liberty, and property was actually in the first draft of the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson took it word for word, and the people in the Continental Congress debated and said, yes, life is certainly a natural right, so too is liberty or freedom. But the majority of delegates did not believe that property was in fact a not natural or God-given right. Instead, the delegates believed that property uh, is a social right. Uh, that you don't uh, get your farm from God, you, you buy your farm from Sam or John or Tim or whoever it happens uh, to be, that people engage in the exchange of property uh, by buying it and by selling it. And so the delegates uh, uh, did not go along with Lockean's philosophy about property and the delegates uh, tried a whole bunch of words here, and eventually we get what I call a weasel word or a weasel phrase in this case, this notion of pursuit of happiness, because uh, it's pretty ambiguous. It varies from individual to individual. But certainly you can see this emphasis uh, of natural rights, and certainly star that uh, when I ask you about Locke on the exam. Uh, I want you to know Locke's connection to natural rights and how that was borrowed uh, heavily in our Declaration of Independence. Now, I would also alert you to a clause uh, in the Constitution. Uh, the 14th Amendment was added uh, after the Civil War. It is one of the three Civil War amendments. 
Uh, I will talk about the, the three Civil War amendments in much more detail later uh, when we get to civil rights. But one of the clauses in the 14th Amendment, the Due Process Clause that is in your notes, states that government cannot deprive people of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Uh, in other words, that 14th Amendment provision is directly taken from John Locke in his second treatise of government. So just like in the case of Thomas Hobbes, where he believed the greatest good was security and the greatest evil was insecurity, and therefore people use government as a tool to protect themselves. If Locke believes that freedom is the primary political value, then the primary purpose of government, according to Locke, is to protect the natural rights of the people. And so the American Revolution, as I pointed out in an earlier mini lecture, it's in your notes, uh, I would underline it and repeat it, the American Revolution is a Lockean revolution. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, who's the primary author, and we, we really give him exclusive authorship. We now know that in reality, uh, Jefferson was influenced a bit by John Adams and Benjamin Franklin in a few uh, cases. But notice, notice what Jefferson is arguing here, that King George and the British government had deprived uh, his citizens of their natural rights and therefore they have both the right and the moral duty to revolt and create a new government that would in fact protect the rights of the citizenry. And so essentially uh, if all social contract theorists believe that government is a contract between the governors and the governed, the argument that Jefferson was making in legalistic terms was that here are the multitude of ways in which King George has violated the contract he has with us, uh, our subjects. Uh, and, and because he has broken the contract in all these ways, we are severing our bonds with Britain. And we now are going to govern ourselves. Uh, in the last bullet there on Locke, uh, you can read along, the best government for Locke is a limited republic with the legislative branch being the leading and the most powerful institution of government. And take a look at your constitution that's in your book, or Google the constitution and look at Article 1. Article 1 deals with the Congress, which is the legislative branch. It is the longest article. It is the most detailed article. When I get to Congress later in the course, one of the observations that I'm going to make is that the Founding Fathers intended, they believed that Congress would be the leading branch of government. And certainly here is another inspiration from Locke. So a lot of political theorists say that you and I were children of John Locke. Uh, and certainly you, you see Locke's fingerprints on the Declaration of Independence. You see John Locke's fingerprints on the 14th Amendment, the Due Process Clause. You certainly see uh, John Locke's fingerprints on Article I of the Constitution uh, with legislative supremacy. Now, the, the last theorist that I want to mention, and I don't want to go into a whole lot of detail here, but, but Montesquieu uh, writes a very different uh, book called The Spirit of the Laws. And Hobbes and Locke were trying to convince people why is government formed in the first place? Why are we the people better off with government than without it? And Hobbes's argument is because governments provide order. And Locke argues it's because governments protect our natural rights and freedom. Montesquieu begins his writing by saying, look, uh, I'm not going to try to convince you we're better off with government than without it. Far better minds than me have done this. Instead, 
I'm going to make the assumption that we're better off with government, and Montesquieu agrees with Locke that we are better off with a limited republic. So Montesquieu is kind of like Aristotle if you go back to the ancient world. Uh, Aristotle was very different than Plato and Socrates, right? Socrates and Plato were trying to explain to people what conditions would be necessary to create the perfect or near-perfect governmental system, what should be. Uh, Aristotle was interested in what is. You know, we, we, we don't have... Uh, a, philosopher kings as as plato wanted uh we're dealing with flawed human beings so what is the best government that is possible uh in the real world and, and that's what montesquieu uh, is arguing he's interested okay uh if we make the assumption that a republic should be our governing system what are some of the basic rules that would operate in a very successful republic and so what I want you to put some stars next to, what the exam question will be uh, involving Montesquieu, uh, is how he influenced James Madison, who I'm going to later give the nickname of the father of the Constitution. Uh, if you take a, a look at the basic skeleton of our Constitution, uh, the two most fundamental ways that power is fragmented in the Constitution, separation of powers, as well as checks and balances. Both of those ideas are borrowed heavily from Montesquieu. And this whole notion that if you check power with power and ambition with ambition, that a natural balance of power will occur, this is at the heart uh, of, of Montesquieu, and certainly this is at the core uh, of Madison. And if you take a look at our Constitution, think about all of the ways that power is fragmented. So our Congress makes laws, right? Our president enforces laws and our courts adjudicate or judge those laws. And of course we have a bureaucracy to enforce them. Uh, these institutions can check and balance one another. Congress can pass a law, but the president can veto it. The Congress and the president can pass a law, but the Supreme Court can declare it unconstitutional. The Supreme Court can declare it something unconstitutional, but then the Congress and the states can override the Supreme Court by changing the Constitution itself. And certainly uh, there are some classic examples uh, of that. For example, in 1857, the U.S. Supreme Court said that former uh, slaves are not citizens and therefore they have no right to sue in court. And if you take a look uh, at the 14th Amendment, one of the provisions there was that it gave black or African Americans former slave citizenship, which overturned the Dred Scott case. Another good example, uh, which uh, I'm reminded of every April 15th, is that at one time the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that Congress did not have the right to levy a federal income tax. And yet, if you take a look, we have uh, a federal income tax. It's a substantial tax. Uh, and that uh, occurred uh, because the Congress and the states passed the 16th Amendment, which provides for the federal income tax. So this notion of checks and balances, separation of powers, and essentially what I would call power fragmentation, because certainly we have power fragmentation in other ways. For example, when we get to federalism, where power is divided between the national government and the states, that would be uh, another check and balance. That would be another way in which powers are separated. Montesquieu did not go into detail about federalism, but certainly it fits into this scheme and Madison operationalized it uh, in the U.S. Constitution. In the next mini lecture, we move away from political theory and we're going to move into the colonial experience. And I'll start out with, uh, I think, a very interesting Randall story uh, that hopefully will entertain you a bit. Have a wonderful day. Uh, I'll be back soon.